Hello and welcome to another episode of the Digital Health and Wearables series. Uh, if you have not uh, watched the previous episodes, please check them out. Great content there. And I want to acknowledge our global partners, Spirit Digital. Check them out. And I have another fantastic leader and guest today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Rachel Domscom, which is the CEO of NHS Digital and also the co-founder of Tech technology right right so yeah the nhs digital academy and technology yeah, yeah absolutely and uh, rachel how are you today i'm good i'm good I, I i you know we were just talking before this about you know what i've been doing earlier and i've been talking about end of life and and using technology to allow people to connect in with their faith leaders and things so it's been a, a real digital health day today very connected into the front line and important stuff Brilliant. I know you are busy and we we know each other, but we spoke several times. I'm also impressed with your work and how you have time to be a board of several uh, organizations and you help a lot of people and do a lot of uh, good things and unpaid work. I know that. So uh, that's yeah. <laughs> very good time from your side. But the first question that I have for you that we can explore is, what do you think it needs to be done in terms of using data more effectively to be available and can be exchanged in a more effective way? Give me your insights, please. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I've been working with sort of wearables for probably about five years now. And with some of the wearable manufacturers sort of going down to gyroscope level, uh, you know, really in-depth data. Um, and the interesting thing is that the data from different vendors varies, yeah? And the problem that we're going to have is a proliferation of different data types. And it's the same problem we had in healthcare. So healthcare, we've had to kind of do the mother of all cleanups and start standardizing our data because we would have had thousands of formats, you know, maybe five, ten years ago. And we've had to start converging on standardized data. The opportunity this brings us is huge, but the risk is that we uh, are allowing a divergence and uh, that in turn has risk because we have to try and sort of harmonize that data later on. And it also provides a friction and reduces the sort of ROI of, of the actual solution because you can't join it with other data easily. Um, now, in traditional healthcare data, we have standards like uh, HR7, Open EHR, and FHIR, which is FHIR, uh, which is Fast Health Interoperability Resources. There are standards, but how do we converge devices that are consumer devices or medical devices forward to a space where they, they speak the same language so that we can safely put it into the health record or safely use it for wellness. So that's kind of my drive. I don't want a million flowers to broom, bloom. You know, I don't want feral data out there that's gone crazy, which we've had in other sectors in healthcare. We want it to be vendor neutral so that it can be used for the length of somebody's you know, life really, um, because we talk about longitudinal records now from, from your birth until you're maybe 90, that data will, you know, inform precision medicine, personalized medicine, and the wearables and the apps and those things are all part of that, but they need to be data that we can, you know, integrate with it easily. Well, fantastic. It's really a minefield. I mean, it, the yeah. opportunity is there. You know, I'm also very interested in wearables and I've been using them and yeah. absolutely the discrepancy of the data unfortunately it's a big issue and also you highlighted there the standardization you know reliability and other things but we spoke very briefly a while ago about open data i mean just yeah. to kind of connect with this last piece before we move on to the next question what is your vision for like an open data collaborative approach so I, I spend a, quite a lot of time doing sort of not-for-profit unpaid work around open data because my view is that we need to move together globally on this. It's a global data set that we need for the human sort of condition. Um, my view is very much that the Open EHR Foundation, of which I'm a director uh, and the community of interest, 
uh, have the right ethos. And that's about thousands of clinicians globally defining data sets that are needed for the human condition collaboratively. And that, you know, that group of clinicians, and there are thousands of them, span right the way from sort of Maori GPs in Australia through to Norway, through to Canada, through to China, uh, Moscow City. It, it is a global collaboration. And I, I you know, just as we, uh, you know, we have standards on the internet now. I was part of the Apache Foundation sort of work in the 90s. I think we we really need that now um, because it is a minimum platform. You know, we have minimum platforms in banking. You can pay in almost every country by a bank card now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we need this in healthcare because humans will travel across the globe. There are, you know, certain things like rare diseases where there are small communities in each country and you need the global population with those diseases to be able to bring their data together to find you know solutions and medicines and so for me um really it needs the global scale uh the other really interesting thing as well is that precision medicine and genomics split people into smaller and smaller groups of commonality so what I mean by that is, you know, somebody may have a form of cancer and there may be a group of people with cancer, but that may then be split by different types of, you know, genome um, sort of panels that they have by other cofactors. And as we get into very specific research of sub communities that have something in common genomically, say, uh, again, we need more global sets of, of people to work with. And so it's really important we standardize that data and indeed increasingly, you know, I, I've used wearables in studies for uh, rheumatology, for rare diseases, for, you know, um, COPD. Increasingly, the input is from things that tell us how the human is, is exercising. One of the most, ex uh, you know, exceptional pieces I was involved in was um, it was around very expensive drugs. They cost between 400,000 and 500,000 pounds a year, uh, but we're only, you know, only effective for less than half the people taking them and the great study was with one of the professors that I worked with and it was about giving the people wearables and seeing there was a link between the amount of exercise they took and the lifestyle factors and the efficacy of that drug and you know if, if we want to do this more and we want to go faster we have to standardize our data. Mm, oh, fantastic this is a fascinating conversation we could spend an hour just on this first <laughs> question. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, also, very quickly, I interviewed the uh, Secretary Minister of Health on a second episode from the Netherlands, Health Wealth oh, and they're yeah. very, very good. Uh, they actually created a law, a, a framework to exchange data. So I'm sure you are aware of that. But for the viewers, if you have not checked that episode, please go and check because it's really interesting. Moving on, um, what, how, how can policy... And we're talking about complex complexity and, and difficult issues in here. How do you see a policy affecting healthcare systems in a positive and more effective manner? Um, yeah, so I think policy around um, a policy is a multi-layer piece, and I, I think what's really helpful is that we're starting to get policy right across the globe now. Um, and I think COVID's helped with that as well. So for me, there, there's policy around opening up data, about sharing data, but getting the balance of privacy for citizens. I think that's a, a really delicate balance, but, but the right thing to do. I also think we're seeing policy um, which is helping innovators move into the marketplace as well, because as you sort of standardize on systems and data and interfaces, um, that is something that, that, that you know small companies medium-sized companies can build towards um and collaborate on um some of the other pieces around policy as well as to the frameworks we're seeing in europe so sort of um you know uh, they apply once they get on a framework and then the whole system can buy the the technology um and, and in the uk certainly some of those have been born out of direct policy uh interactions um I, I think many nations are now going to want really vibrant sort of digital health communities with a lot of smaller companies in them. And so the policy needs to both enable the healthcare systems as the buyers to actually buy this and use it, but it also needs to uh, enable those small to medium sized companies to economically build something that is safe and become sustainable. And um, 
part of the issue I've had actually is with unicorns because it's very unsafe to have unicorns. If seven out of 10 companies uh, go, you know, under or, or you know, 60% uh, or whatever it is in, in you know, the, the different countries, the issue we have there is that healthcare systems will lose faith in buying in these innovations, which may be wearables or devices or whatever else. Um, because they think, are we going to lose this company? Are we going to stop getting this data into our integrated record? And so some of the really nice policy pieces I'm seeing are around supporting smaller companies to innovate. Mm -hmm. So some of the grants that we get through Innovate UK, some of the supporting actions we get in the UK around the small companies in digital health space. I think we need to do more, but I think we're certainly starting on the right footing. Mm, fantastic. It's certainly in UK has been a push about uh, yeah. collaborating further with smaller companies and I've been working with startups for quite some time. I've been seeing the, the challenge in the first five years of existence. It's difficult to break in, but yeah, certainly a lot of work. We're moving in the right direction. And my last question for you, which kind of probably ties in well with that, is what barriers do you see um, in the digital health companies pushing them back? So that, that's interesting. I was reflecting on this uh, recently. So one of the things I, I think is that the the money from the markets is not always aligned with what the buyers need or the or the you know the health systems need, and so um, what what I see for smaller enterprises is their investors don't often understand what they're trying to do over what time scale and, and the complexities of the environment they're in. Mm -hmm. um, also, the the money is not necessarily aligned with uh what the system wants and so um I, I kind of see a mismatch between system needs and what is being developed within the ecosystem and my view is we need to bring them closer and we need to get them to collaborate um i, I also think that technically we need to get a lot better at taking evidence and putting that evidence uh through some rigor and then, you know, allowing new technologies to be deployed as part of pathways or care or prevention. Yeah. Now, traditionally, drugs or medicines have taken 10 years to go through that. So from it being something you you decide you want to test right the way through all the clinical trials, it will take 10 years. We can't afford to have a 10 year cycle for innovation. We can't afford it because the companies can't afford it. We can't afford it because actually there's a lovely line in the NHS constitution. It says we'll work at the frontiers of science, right? It's not the frontiers of science to wait. 10 years, the evidence can be gathered and actioned a lot quicker. So for me, um, it's really uh, about making companies uh, contextual, getting their funding aligned, making sure that they, you know, they have the right environment to work in, uh, making sure the standards are there so they're building towards one target and it can be deployed many places. Um, and yeah, generally on the softer side of it as well, I think it is about those links between the healthcare system and the, the small companies. They need to have a co-existing space and innovate together. So we're seeing some really great progress. Um, but one day I hope what, what most nations will see is that um, GDP growth is, is driven by these companies because they create exports internationally in digital health. And what we need is a symbiosis between our healthcare system and these companies to ensure that, um, you know, we're creating great products with evidence. And I hope one day the UK will, you know, be a center of excellence, if not the center of excellence for digital health uh, globally with this stuff. Um, but you have to get all of the right conditions together to make it to make it a place where there are no dangerous unicorns, I put it that way, so that you don't have the boom and bust and companies disappearing and suddenly you, you, you can't monitor your COPD patients or your asthmatics or whatever else. Um, so it has to feel a bit safer. We need a you know a, a less volatile environment, I think, with everything around. Oh, fantastic, Rachel. You um, highlighted so much in there. I mean, the risk of the unicorns. I'm not a unicorn specialist, but usually they get acquired by a, 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 even a larger organization, and they've been, of course, controlled by that organization in the future. But you mentioned very important things for the digital health ecosystem: the product market fit the enablement in terms of going global, understanding the market. It's actually, digital health is very complex. And as you know, unfortunately, not everybody succeeds. And I've been in this space for quite some time. And the small innovators, sometimes they can't break through because of funding or because of technical expertise, whatever that is. Rachel, it's been a pleasure. 
Fantastic. It's been fun. Thank you so much. I have one last little thing for you, which is not really a, a, a content-driven in digital health space. It's more of a personal thing. I finished mm -hmm. the episodes with a minute of fame that uh, you can give a shout out to anyone, acknowledge a personal achievement, a family thing, a profession, any, any, anything. For you, I could give you a big list of your uh, professional credentials, but it's not about me. It's about you. I'll give you a minute of fame. So there we go. A minute of fame. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something that's been quite on my mind at the moment. And I'd like folks out there to go and Google CyberSyn and uh, viable systems models and, uh, and cybernetics. The reason is CyberSyn was an early internet that was put into Chile in the 1960s to monitor what was happening in the country. And, and when the Ande revolution happened and, and General Pinochet was put in charge, it was all disassembled. But it's the most fascinating thing to go and look at. And out of that came viable systems model, which I love. And I, I just, that's where I'm up to at the moment. And my one moment of fame is, is how do we create viable systems? And I use viable systems model a lot to diagnose where systems are wrong and where they should be right. So that's my minute of fame is really saying my uncle was the founder of CyberSyn. And I just thought I would shout that out because it's it's kind of part of my world at the moment. Fantastic. What a way to uh, complete the episode, Rachel. It's been fascinating. I'm sure Amazing. that the viewers really enjoyed this. So much in there to explore, to learn, to acknowledge. I want to thank you for, for your time. I know you are a busy lady and also your input, expertise, and and thought leadership thing is 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 very highly, uh, very highly regarded by me. So thank you for your time, and we are both a part of the Pink Sox community, which I didn't mention because I had Nick a couple of weeks ago. You know, we, we, we could do an extension of this episode, but that's a different story. Rachel, thank you so much. Keep safe. Have a great day.